I'm going to tell a few stories about Nigel Gray as I knew him. His character and modus operandi explain many of the successes in tobacco control, particularly in the early days. Forgive me if I name very few of the other tobacco control insiders, and there's many of you in the room. Uh, I couldn't name everybody in the time available, everybody who deserves a mention. It was my great good fortune to work with Nigel for 27 years, beginning with his arrival at the then Anti-Cancer Council of Victoria, where I was already working. Nigel had just left his job as Assistant Medical Director at the Royal Children's Hospital. The small staff eagerly awaited Dr Gray's arrival, and facts and rumours of his previous career circulated. We heard our new boss did medicine shortly after the Second World War. He had been a talented schoolboy and university footballer, but he loved skiing more, so much more that there is a tale that he absconded from the InterVarsity football carnival because the snow was so good at Mount Buller. And I can just believe that story. From the very start of our time together, he loved to lounge in his office, chewing the fat on issues confronting the organisation. It rapidly became clear that, despite his background as a patient-focused clinician, he brought to the job a population perspective, no doubt developed when he worked for a period on infectious disease problems in the USA. I recall how rapidly his thoughtful analysis of the cancer scene identified tobacco as the preeminent target and how he saw that public information alone would never solve the problem. I don't recall him actually using infectious disease terms such as vector at that time, but his way of thinking showed that he knew the tobacco industry was the dangerous vector that had to be dealt with. And so the story of Nigel Gray versus Big Tobacco uh, began. In his first year at the Cancer Council, we did a survey of TV advertising in Melbourne. We found that evening viewers saw a cigarette ad every 12 minutes, absolute saturation. Nigel decided that the council had to go after this vector of tobacco disease at whatever cost, and the contest was to be played out on their turf, commercial television. And so work began on the 1971 anti-ad campaign fe featuring British comedy stars, very popular at the time on Australian television, Warren Mitchell, otherwise known as Alf Garnett, and Miriam Carlin from the rag trade, and local actor Frederick Parslow. Nigel somehow managed to get his understandably nervous executive committee to allocate from reserves $50,000 for this campaign, that's about $550,000 in today's terms, to make and broadcast anti-smoking ads. It was typical of his bold style to simply jump into the task while trusting in the god of serendipity. Instead of tedious formalities such as working through actors agents, I remember sitting in his office when he picked up the phone, dialed the hotel where Warren Mitchell was known to be staying, was miraculously put through to his room where Warren miraculously picked up. Oh, hello, I'm Nigel Gray. You don't know me. I'm ringing because. And then followed a potent Gravian charm offensive. Later, after a few drinks at Warren's hotel, it was decided that Warren would recruit Miriam, who in turn recruited Fred, to comprise the cast of three for a total of 25 anti-smoking ads to be filmed over two days in a garage in Fitzroy and a mansion in a borrowed mansion in Turag. Most of the ads were scripted, rehearsed, and then filmed in a matter of minutes, with very few second or third takes. The young John Bevans volunteered his creative script writing, script writing talents too. The aim of the campaign was to get Federal Parliament to legislate against TV and radio advertising of tobacco. Nigel always said that the audience, the target audience, was actually the 120 or so members of the House of Representatives. The ads were not intended to make people quit smoking, which is just as well as research has since shown us that Humour is an ineffective motor of, motivator of cessation. Satire was the chosen weapon in this advocacy campaign. As I recall, a couple of Nigel's favourites were Alfskoff and Cancer Country, so let's take a look at them. that. 
It's a happy thought to think that there are probably people in the audience that never saw a TV advert in Marlborough. That, of course, was a send-up. But among the satirical array of anti-ads, there was a serious hand grenade. This was Nigel's idea to have a straight-faced appeal by Nobel laureate in medicine, Sir Macfarlane Burnett, calling for cigarette advertising to be banned because it was responsible for recruiting teenagers into a deadly addiction. So let's have a look at that one. I'm speaking for the Anti-Cancer Council of Victoria when I say that far too many teenagers are smoking. You know, and every parent knows, why we want young people not to start smoking. The council is asking for a ban on TV advertising of cigarettes because this is a main factor in the high teenage smoking rate and because no government has so far acted. Think over what we say in these commercials. It may be vital for your children's future. When Melbourne TV stations declined to accept the bookings of the anti-ads on the grounds they knocked copy, that is to say, denigrated another client's product, the stations, in effect, banned a Nobel laureate from speaking out in the interests of our children's health. This was the outrage that then became the story, and it ran for days in the media until stations capitulated and our campaign went to air. Nigel's idea to recruit Mac Burnett to the cause was better than cunning, I think it was sheer genius. His sense of humour, his sense of fun, particularly if it could be at the expense of the tobacco industry, was another defining characteristic of his modus operandi, and it explains much of the success. An example of this is, is, of this is his quip about tobacco company chairman Sir Ronald Irish. Um, Nigel was widely reported as saying, uh, in the midst of some illicit drugs hysteria of the day, it seems you get a jail sentence for pushing marijuana, but you get a knighthood for pushing tobacco. I can still see him chortling through the media furore that ensued. But the anti-ads were better than fun. They kick-started public and parliamentary debate, which within three years saw the Whitlam government legislate to phase out over three years TV and radio advertising of tobacco. However, the dismissal of the Whitlam government came before the phase-out had been completed and we were rather querulous. Then about six o'clock one evening in 1975, as we again chewed the fat in Nigel's office, the phone rang. Is that Dr Gray? It's Malcolm Fraser here. I just wanted to discuss what you think about my government completing Labor's phase-out of tobacco advertising. Well, blessed moment. And it showed how quickly Nigel had moved from being a hospital doctor to being a trusted go-to advisor at the highest level of government. And who was it who said all public health is politics? Of course, Nigel understood this better than anyone. And he always worked hard to achieve effective relationships with governments and oppositions. Word of Nigel's acumen was spreading and about 1976 or so, the UICC asked him to invent and lead an international effort to advance tobacco control uh, globally. He recruited a small team of enthusiasts, I won't call them experts, if you forgive me, Mike, um, <laughs> in tobacco control, since at that time I think the expertise was only beginning to be built. One of these enthusiasts, later to be an expert, was Mike Daub, of course, the young director of Action on Soaking and Health, UK. Mike and Nigel were a truly brilliant duo whose credentials were repeatedly endorsed, um, if not to say enhanced by tobacco industry, naming them as enemies uh, in the infamous tobacco documents. <laughs> 
Uh, the UICC project team wrote a manual. I won't say any more about this aspect of Nigel's career because Mike may be able to elaborate a little. Although the skills of, tobacco, of the tobacco control professional are not clinical skills, the fact that Nigel Gray was a medical doctor reminds us how strategically important was the advocacy of a number of respected Australian clinicians of that era. Dr Cotter Harvey from New South Wales and Dr Bill Musk from Western Australia come to mind. The steadfastness of these respected doctors always made it difficult for the tobacco industry to discount their calls for tobacco control measures as some form of religious or other zealotry. The successes of tobacco control in Australia can be explained in no small part by the respectability confirmed by its medical champions. So far as I know, Dr Gray never broke the law in the interests of tobacco control, but other doctors did during the era of mop-up and bugger-up. After a leading plastic surgeon known to me with his teenage son assisting was apprehended by the police defacing a Marlborough billboard in Melbourne in about 1980, the magistrate before whom the surgeon appeared laughed it off, evidently concluding, as we would agree, that the offence was trivial in comparison to the act of inciting people to kill themselves with tobacco. The commitment of our field to the collection over time of sound data on smoking prevalence has been a potent tool of the trade. The first scientific paper on Australian smoking prevalence reported in the Medical Journal of Australia on a national sample survey uh, done in 1974. The paper's lead author was Nigel Gray and the work was funded by the Cancer Council which continued to conduct and publish prevalence studies until its series was made redundant by the Commonwealth's um, National Drug Household Survey much later. Although today we take these prevalence surveys for granted, I remember one well-known and much-loved tobacco control activist, whose name some of you will guess, confessing to me years later that he had acted as a peer review on this first MJA paper and had recommended the journal reject it on the grounds that it was pointless. It was characteristic of this man's uncompromising honesty to own up to this aberration to me later in life. Surveys are essential for defining priority targets for interventions. They help identify modifiable beliefs and attitudes associated with smoking. Trends lines plot progress and often importantly regress, as you can see in that little flat bit where we stalled in the decline of adult smoking. So it's important to know when we're regressing as well as advancing in tobacco control. In fact, the stalling of a previous decline in smoking prevalence you see there in the mid-90s was crucial in capturing the attention of a federal minister of health and his allocating serious money for the groundbreaking national tobacco campaign. Finally, prevalence surveys can sheet home exquisitely, as in this figure, the co-variation in an entire population between smoking and disease over a long period of time. The other great big data resource has been tobacco consumption records arising from the collection of federal excise duty. Excellent use has been made of these data by very able Australian researchers who have quantified the relationships between price and consumption in the context of other interventions that also put downward pressure on smoking rates. This has enabled arguments in favour of tobacco control to, uh, measures to be almost literally sugar-coated with revenue-raising prospects for governments. High-quality tobacco control research conducted by a number of star Australian researchers has been cons a consistent feature of our landscape, and I'm sure it explains many of the successes. Just as pract that practical problems and opportunities for tobacco control research emerged over time, so did the research findings that justified new policies and programs along the way. A number of our tobacco researchers are among the most highly cited in the world. Just as we know that if a country wants the best health care delivered to its people, it, it needs medical research built into the system, we also know that ongoing tobacco control research invigorates practice and enhances impact. Yet sometimes we seem to suffer from you knew, you in you, useful but not used syndrome. That is failure to implement findings of research that have been shown to be beneficial. I was close to one example of this. In 1999, Penny Schofield published a paper in an, in an international journal 
showing that if smoker status was recorded at the point of admission to a public hospital and smoker patients two weeks later, uh, when they were uh, two weeks after discharge, received a letter and a pamphlet advising quitting smoking signed by their consultant, the biochemically validated prevalence a year later was lower than otherwise. So far as I know, hospitals in Victoria have never adopted this cessation strategy. There are probably other examples where simple, cheap, effective interventions are not implemented because to do so disturbs some spurious bureaucratic or system obstacle, such as changing the form uh, used to collect data before admission to hospital. My guess is that even now there are many missed opportunities to implement research knowledge, knowledge that is just there for the taking. Turning from things we uh, could have done but didn't, there were things we did do but shouldn't have. Very, a, a very early mistake was made by Nigel Gray, together with me and others, to pursue that illusory safe or at least less dangerous cigarette. Given the established dose-response relationship between tobacco, smoke, exposure and lung cancer risk, it made a lot of sense, of course, to conclude in the 1960s that reducing the total particulate matter, or tar, uh, measured by a smoking machine in cigarettes would reduce risk to smokers. The Cancer Council was the first in Australia to advocate for and indeed undertake at Monash University measurement of tar delivered by different brands. The results were post published with noticeable impact on brand sales. In fact, so successful was their advocacy that it became an official duty of the Australian Government Analytic Laboratories to test and report on tar content of all brands. Eventually it was mandated that tar and nicotine should be included on all cigarette packs for the information of smokers. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But we now know, and the tobacco industry almost certainly then knew, that smokers can get just as much nicotine and tar from low tar cigarettes as high tar cigarettes by sucking harder or more frequently. And this is what smokers do, unconsciously, to obtain their usual desired dose of the drug nicotine. We had naively gifted to the tobacco industry a new market segment, which it disdainfully, disdainfully referred to as the hypochondriac market segment. There are moments in public health when the precautionary principle, acting judiciously in the absence of all the evidence you might like to have, should be applied. But mostly it's dangerous to hasten before evidence exploring all the possibilities has been collected. We should have paused to do naturalistic studies of how smokers actually use these low tar variants. We would have discovered, as the industry already had, the flawed logic in promoting low tar cigarettes. That parable may have present day relevance as we consider the advent of the e-cigarette. While our federal system of government is often blamed for waste and missed opportunity, in tobacco control I think it has served us very well. This is best demonstrated by the brilliant idea, the Dirty Ashtray Award of the AMA. The jurisdictional powers of the states have permitted state governments to act and enact in almost every facet of tobacco control, except broadcasting and excise. There were, through the lifetime of Nigel Gray, too many examples of, uh, to list of states innovating some legislation or program, only to have others either willing or shamed into following suit. Interestingly, many of these initiatives first arose in Western Australia. The longest running example of interjurisdictional ratcheting of tobacco control measures is smoke free spaces. Smoke free public transport, including on aircraft, caught on early, but not always for the reasons you might think. In Victoria in the 1970s, the reason given by the Minister of Transport for banning smoking on trams and trains was to reduce the clean up costs of discarded butts. Our field was a bit slow to grasp the powerful leverage that passive smoking concerns afforded. I have to admit that I and others at the time were rather incredulous about the effects of involuntary smoking. Dr. T Takishi Hiriyama, a somewhat eccentric Japanese epidemiologist, was the first to report the increased risk of lung cancer in non-smoking wives of smokers. It was only after others began replicating his findings that we started to believe, by which time public demand for protection had gotten ahead of health promotion wisdom. Nevertheless, I think we were probably right to be cautious as the risk of exaggerating harms is more consequential than being a bit slow to be convinced. 
The greatest example of tobacco control um, innovation that precipitated cross-border conflagration was the Victorian uh, Tobacco Act, 1986. In this, Nigel Gray was absolutely pivotal, although there were crucial players from outside the public health sector who made it happen. While he is best known internationally for his pioneering work through the UICC, he is best known here for the Tobacco Act uh, and the early years of VicHealth. The Act levied a state licence fee from tobacco retailers, some of the proceeds of which were hypothecated to the new Victorian Health Promotion Foundation, that is VicHealth, to spend on health promotion, particularly but not exclusively on tobacco control. Soon advocates in other states were lobbying for the same thing with signal success, at least in Western Australia and South Australia. The planning and passing of the bill was a wonderful tale, not only of clear-sighted strategising, but also of luck, opportunism, inventiveness, intrigue, surprise, even religion. As well as its revenue raising provisions, the Act created VicHealth and charged it with providing funds to sport and the arts to effectively buy out uh, the tobacco companies which had been so heavily funding them. It was arguably the most significant piece of state tobacco control legislation ever enacted in Australia. Well, luck helps. Dr Gray was calling on the then Health Minister David White to pitch for funding for screening mammography when just as Nigel was about to leave the room the Minister unexpectedly asked what the government could do about tobacco. It soon became apparent that Minister White was driven to make an impact on tobacco because his father had been killed by a tobacco related disease. Be ready when opportunity knocks. Nigel, though not expecting this opportunity, was ready for it. He didn't miss a beat, presenting a few options to entice an interested minister. But Nigel was far from prescriptive. Uh, rather, he sensed that David White had an appetite for something innovative and bold, and so was begun a collaboration, or as the tobacco industry would probably have said, a collusion. Inventiveness. David White had in his office several extremely talented advisers who, with input from the Cancer Council, developed a proposal that was both technically and more importantly, politically gifted. The tobacco bill would raise revenue under powers then available to the state, i.e. licence fees for retailers. It would spend money on programs to reduce the risk of smoking. Particularly, it was cleverly emphasised, the risk of your kids smoking. Whilst it did not actually promise motherhood, it did promise the next best thing, medical research and health promotion more broadly. Whilst it would not, and probably could not, attempt to ban tobacco advertising and promotion outright, it would provide the funds to outbid the industry. This converted nearly every community, sports and arts organisation in the state from being opponents into allies of tobacco control. Intrigue. The Premier of the day, John Kane, was not at first keen on the idea, so the early intrigue required winning over Premier and Cabinet. I'm not privy to much of that, but I did get a glimpse of the politics during an interview with Bob Hogg, who was the government's most senior advisor. The Cancer Council had done a public opinion survey to test public response to the, the kinds of measures being contemplated, which was generally quite favourable. I was called to Bob Hogg's office to explain and elaborate. I remember being both stunned and impressed by Mr Hogg's uh, knowledge of survey methodology, his attention to detail, his nose for bias, uh, and his challenging stance. There was no way he was going to be, uh, rely on flawed survey data to support this legislation or to expose his boss to political risk. Fortunately, our save survey, which was a legitimate example, I think, of advocacy-driven research, passed his test. The next level of intrigue involved getting the Liberal opposition on side. We had a foothold in that Mark Birrell was the Shadow Minister of Health. Mr Birrell had, as, Mon as a Monash University student member of the Young Liberals, proposed to a state conference a policy to ban cigarette advertising. Of course, it had not succeeded. Nigel acted as the trusted go-between, apprising Mark Birrell of the proposal for a bill, relying on him to keep confidences um, and to start to prepare the ground among his parliamentary colleagues. The Liberal Party support was essential since the coalition controlled the Victorian upper house. Uh, this was how the bipartisan support for the bill was, was built and bipartisanship has carried on into the life of Vic Health to this day.
with MPs sitting from both sides sitting on the board of Vict Health. Surprise was also important. Everyone on the inside was well aware of the lobbying power of the tobacco industry and its ability to mobilise certain sectors in its support. So the plan needed to be well advanced as possible before the industry got wind of it, which was what happened. A powerful element was the success, in success was the Age newspaper, whose then editor, Creighton Burns, was persuaded to run a series of five feature articles over five successive days about tobacco and in support of the legislation. The tobacco companies must have thought that all health had broken loose. Now, I'll bet you've been waiting for the last one. Religion, how did that come into it? Just to make sure that all the bases were covered, Nigel, who is not uh, religiously aligned himself, uh, used his network of influential people to ensure that both the Catholic and Anglican archbishops were briefed, were on side, and most importantly, communicated their view to the political leaders. For example, he spoke to a palliative care colleague who spoke to her husband, who was the head of a major corporation and was a leading lay Anglican, and he spoke to his archbishop. Shortly after the passage of the bill, Time magazine ran the story as its feature article using this photo of Nigel and David White sitting on the steps of Parliament. To me, this is one of the most iconic images in the history of public health in Australia. All in all, it was a meticulously planned and executed piece of public health reform, implemented against a powerful and a wealthy opponent. Could we do it that way again if we had to? Probably not. Those were simpler times and it's much harder for governments to achieve bold initiatives, uh, bold, uh, in, uh, bold objectives. And the tobacco industry is even more vigilant, aggressive, litigious and egregious than it was then. After the Victorian Act was passed, Vic Health had to be bedded down and to learn how to wisely spend its $22 million a year. That's $50 million in today's terms. Nigel cleverly declined uh, to take the role of chairman of Vic Health and instead <coughs> persuaded the impeccably credentialed and articulate Sir Gustav Nossel to take it on. It was a masterstroke to bring such a prestigious basic medical scientist into the fold and just as Nigel had done with Burnett in 1971. It's always a good strategy to keep tobacco control closely aligned to basic medical science as well as with clinical medicine. No reflection on tobacco control is complete without consideration of litigation by the tobacco industry and sometimes against it. I'm glad to say that the tobacco industry has generally failed to succeed in its legal, strate in its legal strategies. An exception to this occurred in Roller McCabe's case in the Victorian Court of Appeal. This delivered the astonishing judgment that tobacco company lawyers who destroyed documents relevant to Roller's case were entitled to have done so, even after the case had commenced and those documents were clearly relevant. But the industry's legal challenge to the NHMRC's 1995 report on passive smoking failed to prevent the march of smoke-free regulation. It failed in its vindictive pursuit of tobacco control advocate Steve Woodward uh, related to the AFCO case. Most recently, it failed in the High Court in its case to prevent plain packaging legislation taking effect. Often, if not always, the tobacco industry uses the law as a business tactic in the absence of a just cause or even much hope of winning. It's a chill strategy available to companies with bottomless pockets. I once spoke with a senior lawyer who confessed in my hearing to having defended companies who had done some very reprehensible things. However, he said that such companies, even if they win in court, are capable of being shamed to change their ways by the court of public opinion. The only exception, the only exception to this is the shameless tobacco industry, he said. This lawyer also quipped that as clients, tobacco companies are known to complain about their invoices for legal services. Because when the bills are too small, they suspect the lawyers are not trying hard enough to screw their enemies. I was only involved directly in one case when the Tobacco Institute of Australia sued the Anti-Cancer Council in the federal court under provisions of the, Tobac of the Trade Practices Act in 1992. Since this is an act designed to stop businesses ripping each other off, or ripping members of the public off, when the writ arrived, we were as surprised as we were alarmed. The TIA's assertion was that a research report, this one, 
commissioned by the Commonwealth on Cigarette Pack Warnings and written by our CBRC, uh, made recommendations that threatened to damage their business, their packaging and their brands. Now, to be sued under the provisions of the Trade Practices Act, I understand that you have to be engaged in trade or commerce. It never occurred to me that our research and reporting of it could be considered commercial. To be on the safe side in getting us into the court, the TIA's lawyers set a trap that we fell into. A young law clerk was uh, sent around to our offices to obtain the report. Reception called me about it and I authorised them to give the person a copy. It was a public document after all. The receptionist called back moments later to say that the clerk was insisting on paying and needed 25 copies. Quite an expensive order since the report was 100 pages long. Um, having calculated quickly the cost of replacing 25 copies, I agreed to let them pay. And I understand that was the mistake that opened the door to us an action under the Trade Practices Act. After months of stress while the proceedings were pending, Nigel Gray spoke with the Premier, Jeff Kennett, who was not known to be a friend of tobacco control. However, Mr Kennett evidently took great exception to an industry bullying a fine charitable institution in his state and told the industry what he thought. The action lapsed. Still, despite uh, failing in our courts, the tobacco industry remains in its use of law as relentless as it is inventive. Who would have thought that an Australian tobacco company would have arranged to have itself bought by an eponymous company in another country just to allow it to litigate under the provisions of an obscure bilateral trade agreement Australia has with that country? The final phase of Nigel's career at the Cancer Council, in a sense, book was, was the bookend to match his work in achieving the ban on broadcast advertising of tobacco in the early 70s. I refer to the stunningly successful work done uh, both within and outside government that led to the Tobacco Advertising and Promotion Act 1993. Merely a few years before its passage, to ban all forms of tobacco advertising and promotion was to me at least unthinkable, just seen as a bridge too far. But the rapidity of this change belies all the strategising, the patience and persistence, attention to detail and the high level of politico-bureaucratic intelligence that underpinned it. Compared with the 1970s, tobacco control was now a far more highly developed field of public health, with a much larger and more sophisticated workforce engaged in it. Credit for the TAP Act is shared by my, among many people, some of whom are in, the, in this room and they all know who they are. And those people will remember Nigel's ongoing wise advice and occasional strategic interventions to get the federal leg legislation through. Nigel retired as director of the Anti-Cancer Council in 1996, having led the organisation for 28 years. He was almost immediately offered a part-time position as a cancer research, at a cancer research institute in Milan, Italy, followed by a similar appointment at IARC in Lyon, France. These appointments uh, made, allowed him to write for publication and speak extensively at important international conferences for a decade. He served on the WHO Committee on Tobacco Regulation where he made a significant contribution in deliberations on regulating combustion products of tobacco to limit exposure to one of the most toxic NNK. So his location and intellectual focus lay outside of Australia for most of the time when two major developments occurred in this country. Of course, Nigel was always a presence, but from now on mostly cheering from the sidelines. The first of these initiatives was the National Tobacco Campaign 1997. This was an opportunity for the first time to conduct a well-funded national mass media social marketing campaign. It was the result of work done and funds set aside at the end of the Keating government by Health Minister Carmen Lawrence and by the perspicacity of the new Health Minister in the Howard government, Michael Wooldridge. Dr Wooldridge somehow managed to hide from the new government's cost-cutting budget police um, the fact that nine million from this labour initiative remained in his departmental budget. He was passionate to attack the smoking problem and at first was effect attracted to the politically seductive option of running a prevention campaign aimed at teenagers. But he was a good listener as well as being decisive and was persuaded to back the cessation campaign which was known as Every Cigarette is Doing You Damage. I was deeply involved in the National Tobacco Campaign. It was certainly one of the most rewarding aspects of my working life. 
There were a number of features that account for its success, and it was successful. The drop in smoking prevalence attributed to its first phase was estimated by Susan Hurley to be worth 740 million uh, in health expenditure saving. First, it was successful because it was a favourite project of the health minister. I remember him beaming at the launch of the campaign and saying, politics doesn't get any better than this. Such was his support uh, for the campaign that he repeatedly made time available in his electoral office on a Friday afternoon to meet and chat over strategy and process, free of the usual bureaucratic processes. Secondly, the Ministerial Tobacco Advisory Group, MTAG as we were known, created a clear behavioural model, as Maurice Swanson called it, that articulated clearly in about a page and a half the psychological assumptions on which all the communications were to be based. Thus, from the start, everybody had the same song sheet to sing from. And to write a behavioural model for folk forces you to get off the fence and say exactly why you think your intervention will change an individual's behaviour. Third, we selected the right advertising agency, BMF Sydney. Unlike the other two or three agencies we interviewed who pitched specific anti-smoking concepts to us, BMF basically said, we have no preconceived ideas, we have a lot to learn, but we do good work. Fourth, there was a reservoir of interjurisdictional goodwill to draw upon. The bureaucratic skill shown by federal and state health department officials was harnessed by including them in the development and implementation of the campaign. When the TV ads went to air, the end frame attribution was to federal and state governments together. Fifth, there was an adequate amount budgeted for research and evaluation. A two-volume evaluation report was published and a special issue of tobacco control, I think I suppose to Simon Chapman, got the whole story into the peer-reviewed literature. Now the second great initiative post Nigel's re retirement, I think we'd agree, was plain packaging. Earlier I mentioned you knew, useful but not used. And now in concluding, I want to return to that problem and ask what if? What if every not used opportunity by every participant in tobacco control was turned into a used opportunity? How close could we get us to that elusive end game in tobacco control? So beginning with my previous example, what if every hospital inpatient could not even be admitted to hospital without smoker status being recorded by the admissions clerk, which would later trigger post-discharge consultations, consultant's letter and quit resource? What if every parent who smokes would quit before their kids turn, say, 12? What if parents adopted a clearly reasoned stance against their kids smoking uh, even, if it, even if they didn't quit themselves? And what if every doctor routinely checked patients' smoking status and acted according to all the evidence we have about what they can do to influence um, their patients' smoking? What if every shopkeeper always checked the age of young tobacco purchases? And what if every treasurer, every budget, increased tobacco taxes? From the effect sizes reported in the literature about such interventions, we could estimate how many quitters would result and plot progress towards the end game. Nigel Gray rightly received many honours for his work. The Order of Australia, Honorary Doctor of Laws from two universities, the Luther Terry Award and many more. But he was highly conscious of others who did not receive such recognition and yet had done so much. So it was absolutely in character for him to wish to endow an award to be presented at each of the Oceania conferences, sometimes to recognised leaders, but most particularly to those he believed were under-recognised for their wonderful work. Thank you. David asked me to add a few words about Nigel's international work because I had the privilege of being involved in much of it from the early years and as you said we made a good team in my view probably because we were both tall, suave and particularly good looking. <laughs> but I'd been in contact with him since uh, 1973 as we had similar leadership roles in campaigning in uh, Australia and the UK but we first met at the 1975 World Conference on Tobacco in New York 
where he, Dr. Hjell Bjartweit, the Norwegian health minister who was responsible for their ad ban, Sir George Godber, the British chief medical officer, and I met and Nigel started generating real international action on smoking. And it's hard to appreciate now how difficult tobacco control was then nationally, let alone internationally. The resources were minute. There was minimal support. The industry was powerful and respectable. There weren't many people working in the area and things were really tough for anybody working on tobacco. But despite all of that, Nigel, within a year, brought a small group of us together under the auspices of the International Union Against Cancer. I don't know how he cobbled those resources together. And we wrote the first manual on guidelines for tobacco control. Then Nigel decided that we should get all the main international and national NGOs and WHO to adopt the policies, so we did. And that marked the first time there were clear consensus tobacco control policies. And that 1976 policy seems simple, seems simple now. It wasn't then, but remarkably, it stood the test of time. What Nigel put together has stood the test of time amazingly well. <laughs> of course, a few wrinkles here and there, especially after uh, Takeshi Hiriyama's 1981 landmark uh, paper on passive smoking, and then Nigel, of course, recruited Takeshi into the team. But that comprehensive approach is still the basis for international tobacco control and a huge monument to Nigel. Having done that, he set about making things happen under the auspices of the UICC, the only international health organization that was willing to support an international tobacco program. And that program was quite remarkable. It operated on a shoestring. It essentially had Nigel cobbling together funding, leading a small group of us around the world, and then as the program developed, sending off further groups of good people he'd identified from various countries. And in retrospect, I mean, it was one of the, Nigel's characteristics. It was all done with amazing nerve. We'd waltz into countries, demand ahead of time that cancer councils and other groups provide support, which amazingly they did, bring people together, arrange site visits, organize regional workshops, demand and get plenary sessions on tobacco at cancer and other conferences where prevention had never been on the menu meet with ministers, recruit new people, write further reports. He would just make things happen, and, and they did. And there are many countries where the first action on tobacco or the first inspiration of activists on tobacco, many of whom are now international names, occurred because of Nigel's programme. There are a few that I remember in particular. I remember in the Philippines, when an audience for a of a workshop of 25 turned into, into 5,000, and that's because President Marcos opened the workshop, so staff were bussed in from all Manila's hospitals to ensure a good crowd for the president. Even in Indonesia, despite the president's family interests in the tobacco industry, Nigel had a good and friendly meeting with President Suharto. In Egypt, the Cancer Society's patron was the uh, president's wife, Madame Sadat. She met with us, she heard Nigel speak, and took the message home, and the next morning, President Sadat issued a decree banning television cigarette advertising. So Nigel almost single-handedly persuaded other international and national health organizations to adopt the UICC policy. Interest in, w in tobacco and WHO then was minimal, very different from now, as was the caliber of the people then involved. In fact, at one of our meetings, I still remember Nigel describing them as people who spoke nine languages fluently but thought in none of them. <laughs> but his work with UICC embarrassed WHO, they then got us, led by Nigel, to rewrite the UICC manuals, a WHO report. Then they started to replicate the UICC program, but needed Nigel and his crew to make it happen. He contributed everywhere. I reckon probably around 100 international workshops and conferences from, the UI, from Nigel's UICC program alone. He was a key figure, not just in the UICC, where he ensured a continuing focus on tobacco during his term as president, but in leading international collaborations, committees, and working with anyone he thought could contribute. He played a key role in ensuring the early international leadership and tobacco control of the American Cancer Society, and he persuaded them and funding agencies in the US, Norway, Canada, and elsewhere to support tobacco control. And he did a lot else, not least, as Maurice will remember, chairing the program committee for the 1990 World Conference on Tobacco, which we organized here in Perth. And I still think it's stunning to think that he did so much in the pre-internet era from Melbourne as an add-on to the day job of running a cancer council and leading so much other activity. As we've heard from David, after his notional retirement, he continued to work on tobacco internationally across a huge range of areas. But there's an in internal Philip Morris Tobacco Company document from the 1980s that provides a pretty good summary. 
It is the Australian Dr. Gray who appears to have done more than any other individual to bring the anti-tobacco movement together in an international sense, to exert pressure on governments and other influential bodies. Starting with the seminal workshop on smoking and lung cancer in 1976, he began to work with and through the UICC as a flexible and single-minded international organization, setting in motion the chain of events which led to the formation of an international liaison group on smoking and health with himself as chairman. The UICC workshops were his idea and also the program on smoking and cancer with what are virtually regional coordinators for specific areas. As Philip Morris rightly said, his special contribution is to organize the integration of the disparate elements of the anti-tobacco movement into the most organic whole that it could be. He was a wonderful and supportive friend and mentor. I owe him a special de debt for persuading me to move to Australia in 1984, and as some of you may have heard me say before, I've also almost forgiven him for his 1970s comment about the distinguished academic Bob Wake and a young campaigner of the time, when he said, Bob's all presence and no performance, and Mike's all performance and no presence. <laughs> <laughs> so Nigel, who was phoning even until shortly before his death on, on Saturday afternoons, I still remember he'd phoned, he deserves to be remembered and revered as the father of tobacco control globally as well as in Australia, complementing all that wonderful work that David's described. He developed the policies that are still today the core for everything that we do, and for decades was the single most important figure in developing action internationally, and in my view should have had a Nobel Prize. So that's why we have a Nigel Gray Medal. And the Nigel Gray Medal is presented at Oceania conferences to people who are recognized as having made an outstanding contribution to tobacco control with a bias to those who've been unsung or undersung. The vote follows a call for nominations. The award is made on the basis of a secret ballot by a panel, quite a few actually, chaired by the CEO of the Cancer Council of Victoria, comprising tobacco control leaders from Australia and New Zealand. Todd Harper, who chaired this year's panel as CEO of the Cancer Council of Victoria, is unable to be here, so he asked me to announce the outcome and the award will be presented by David and myself. The voting was so close that two names came up equally at the top and the panel didn't feel able to separate them. I'm pleased to add that Anne Gray has also written an enthusiastic support for the winners. Presented in alphabetical order and uh, the, the first alphabetically is Denise Sullivan. As with all of them, there's a terrific uh, a nomination for Denise. She's worked at a senior level in tobacco control for 20 years in both government and non-government sectors, understanding their complementary roles and mastering the myriad complexities in both. She's been outstanding in the public forum as an articulated and talented tobacco control advocate, or working behind the scenes as a key strategic thinker and shaper of state and national policy. And she's also generous in her support for the next generation of, of tobacco control, uh, control advocates. Uh, this note says she's skilled in diplomacy, but even better at telling it how it is. I think some of us would recognize that. Um, she uh, had her first uh, roles in tobacco control in the uh, running the WA Health Department Smoking and Health Program. Uh, and there she also oversaw enforcement and uh, monitoring and enforcement of various aspects of, uh, of legislation. And she sat on various high-level ad advisory committees and has worked uh, particularly since, again, since her return to government uh, in that area. She uh, uh, then moved to the Cancer Council to be director of tobacco programs there where she ran a range of innovative mass media programs and other comprehensive parts of the comprehensive approach, uh, including hard-hitting, uh, groundbreaking television advertising, such as the Nice People advertisement, or the, the generating the Zeta ads and, and various uh, television advertisements of, of that nature. Uh, she commissioned important uh, research, in, uh, including by Collins and Lapsley and others. Uh, she chaired the Cancer Council's Tobacco Issues Committee. She worked closely with uh, Aboriginal health researchers, including the Colongo Research Network. She was also an adjunct uh, senior uh, fellow with the uh, University of Western Australia. And after a successful stint in, uh, in, in the Cancer Council, 
She then moved to uh, the health department as director of chronic disease prevention, where again she's played a crucial role in further development of tobacco control policy nationally uh, as well as uh, uh, within WA and has been a key member of, uh, of a range of, of important committees. So Denise Sullivan, who's also played a role through the FCA internationally, has been a leader in tobacco control uh, here within NGOs, within government and, and across the board and is a very worthy winner of the Nigel Gray Medal. I'm actually still getting my head around this, despite the fact that I had a couple of weeks' notice of this. Um, thank you very much to David, the Cancer Council Victoria, members of the selection committee and colleagues who nominated me for the Nigel Gray Award. I'm grateful and honoured to receive this award and in the company of colleagues for whom I have such deep admiration and respect. My career in tobacco control has been incredibly rewarding, both professionally and personally. I've had opportunity to work and learn from incredibly smart and generous people, and I've benefited from the trust of others in me. And most important of all, I've been allowed the opportunity to experience and build on the extraordinary legacy and roadmap for action on tobacco so eloquently set out by Nigel Gray many years ago and described by Mike and, and David today. I'm especially grateful to Mike Dorb and Marie Swanson, who set me on a career in tobacco control and have been constant um, companions throughout. Um, I'm also very grateful to many others, and my apologies for not naming you all, but when I started to think about who I wanted to say thank you to, the list was getting quite long. But I also want to recognise the wise women and men of the West who have been generous with their advice and expertise and ready to lend the might of their agencies in pushing for action and investment by governments, and to colleagues from the East and the South Pacific who continue to demonstrate um, the, collegi the collegiality um, that has been a hallmark of tobacco control efforts in this country and in this region. I'd also like to pay tribute to CEOs, board members and staff, past and present, whose foresight, ingenuity and commitment to the cause has allowed WA to shine nationally and internationally for its work in tobacco control. I thank you for this award, which I also accept on behalf of the many individuals and organisations who have encouraged and guided and supported and joined with me in this madness that is tobacco control. And it's nice for us all to be recognised in this way, so thank you very much. The second winner of the 2015 Nigel Gray Award is Marie Swanson. And again, if I can just say a few words about, about Maurice. Maurice Swanson has been a committed tobacco campaigner for nearly 40 years. He doesn't look it, but it's true. And he's played a critical role in the development of legislation, policy, and public education campaigns on tobacco on state and national levels that's helped establish Western Australia's reputation as a world leader in tobacco control and Australia's reputation through a range of activities. He uh, started in, in an 18-year career first with the WA State Public Service, where he tested the boundaries of what was acceptable from, from a public servant. And in the early years, at significant risk to his own career, he lobbied health ministers, opposition health spokespersons, and senior bureaucrats, urging greater commitment to prevention in general and tobacco control in particular. He worked closely with ACOSH and other NGOs in their campaigning for legislation on tobacco, often, fortunately, with the tacit approval of the Health Minister of the day. He played a leading role in energetic and sustained campaigning by the Department of Health and through briefing of Ministers for Health, which was crucial to the passage of the Tobacco Control Act 1990, legislation achieved after eight years of collective campaigning. He was responsible for implementation and enforcement of the Act and played a leading role in development of the 1995 larger text-based health warnings, where WA was the only state actually to gazette, the, uh, to gazette the regulations. Throughout his term with government, he continued to advocate internally for ongoing reform of the legislation to make sure it kept pace with innovations and tactics of the industry. 
As Director of Health Promotion Services, he oversaw the department's public education campaigns on smoking, constantly coming up with new ideas and approaches and ways of demonstrating the harms caused by smoking and the urgency to quit, and of course played a key role in the organization of the 1990 uh, World Conference. And he also staved off tobacco industry attempts at access to health department research informing its education campaigns. In 1998, he was appointed Chief Executive Officer of the National Heart Foundation's WA Division, and in that role, he's continued to play a major and more public role in championing tobacco control locally and nationally, and he also continues to play an important role, as does Denise, in nurturing the next generation of uh, tobacco uh, uh, control advocates ever willing to, uh, to share his uh, uh, his, his advice and experience. He's had a huge involvement in really pretty much all the developments in tobacco control in, in the last decades, not just in tobacco, not just in WA, but nationally, whether in front of the scenes, as it were, in front of the microphone, uh, um, representing the Hart Foundation, or behind the scenes. And it's lovely to see in the, in the tobacco documents, even going back to his time when he was in government, uh, the concerns that the industry uh, uh, expressed about this doesn't sound good at all, especially WA taking the lead. They are taking the lead. This will spread elsewhere. Don't want to sound alarmist, but I am alarmed. Is one lovely comment from uh, when Maurice was uh, uh, at, at, at the steering wheel. He's been uh, a heavy duty campaigner. Uh, he was a founding member of the Tobacco Working Group that, that David chaired. He's been a long-standing member of ACOSH, and he's had a host of other roles. And uh, again, as an outstanding tobacco control campaigner, he's an incredibly worthy uh, joint winner of this year's Nigel Gray Medal. I'm delighted to um, accept this award um, named in honour of Dr Nigel Gray. Um, when I first joined ACOSH in 1981, um, the people around that, uh, that meeting table at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital always spoke in reverent terms about Nigel, the advice that Nigel was providing on required tobacco legislation and all things that could be done to um, to curb smoking in Australia and internationally. I first met Nigel in 1987 at the World Conference in, in Tokyo and um, he provided lots of encouragement to Mike and myself and others in our pitch for the World Conference here in Perth in 1990. Nigel is really the grandfather of tobacco control in this country and has played a, a fantastic an influential role internationally. I just wanted to say also that it's been uh, a career privilege to work with so many dedicated people. Many of them are in this room um, this afternoon. And um, it's because uh, we've stuck at it, we've persevered, um, we've dedicated many, many years to this task that we have the results that we can now be so proud of. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Maurice and, and Denise, and I've got no doubt that Nigel would have approved the decision to have two medal winners, and I would also like you once again to join me in congratulating the Nigel Gray medalist for today.